the Lord. God answers prayer. And there are people that go through some difficulties, and Nancy has been through a lot, and her husband Frank, as many of us are. And so when we pray, we pray fervently, and we believe God to do some great things. So when Lisa leaned over to me and says, Nancy Murphy's in the church today, that is such a, a praise, that is such an answer to prayer. So let's take our Bibles this morning, and I want to get into God's Word with you. There are certain books of the Bible uh, that we kind of gravitate to as Christians. Some people would have a, maybe a favorite verse. Um, has anybody ever had a favorite verse in the Bible before you had a favorite verse? Anybody? No? That was a big thing back in like the 80s and 90s. You know? and so, but there are certain books of the Bible that, that you might lean more towards. Um, books like Obadiah, right? You love the book of Obadiah. You're thinking, where is that? I don't even know where that is. Or Nahum. Um, in all seriousness, what book of the Bible would you lean towards in your history of your Christian life? Just say it out loud. The book of Psalms. Anything else? There's Peter. What was that? James is another one. Isaiah. Micah. Oh, you're hardcore, man. Hardcore. Wow. That's awesome. Josh Cole. Love it. I lean towards 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus. The reason for that, because I have been called to pastoral ministry. And so through the years, that is where I kind of lean towards. Not that I don't love all of the Word of God. I think, too, that if you're doing well spiritually, you're going to love the whole totality of Scripture. You'll love Old Testament and New Testament, right? And so I would encourage you not to pick and choose certain Scriptures and go, I want to learn from this Bible book of the Bible. Or this other one's not really relevant to me, so I'm going to kind of tune out, have words with friends going, maybe start texting while Pastor Chris is preaching out of, because that happens. Some of you will check out in the next few minutes because we're going to talk about church leadership. You're going to think, I'm not a church leader, so I don't really need to listen to the Word of God. And so, but we all need to listen to the Word of God, wherever that is, from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. And so, but I have leaned towards First and Second Timothy and Titus through the years of my life, and they've been an incredible blessing to me. Paul is the writer of these. He's writing to Timothy, and he's writing to Titus. These two pastoral epistles is what they call, are called. Uh, the title of them is really based on their, their name, the book of Timothy and the letter to Titus. And I have chosen to go into the book of Titus, or the letter to Titus is what it's called. It's a five-part series, and I started it last week with you, and it's titled Clash of the Cretans. Clash of the Cretans. Now, Cretans came from the island of Crete. It's in the middle of the Mediterranean. You'll see an image on the screen, and this is what it looks like today. It did not look like this centuries ago. Today, it's a destination that mo many people will travel uh, on their summer breaks or whenever throughout the year that they feel so led to go to the island of Crete. But back in those days, it was much different in the days of the Apostle Paul and Titus. Acts chapter 2 records Cretans at, the, uh, at Pentecost. And you remember I showed that to you last Lord's Day. And some of these Cretans were converted to Christianity, then took the gospel back to the island of Crete. And then they started meeting in the fellowships uh, or community groups and house churches and and so that was how the church began on the island of Crete. We would call them Cretans. The culture of Crete would stick with mythology and hedonism. The believers were immature and struggling. Uh, churches were uh, experiencing a leadership vacuum. And any church that is in a struggle or decline or plateaued, you can always pinpoint it to a leadership vacuum. And that's what was happening on the island of of Crete. It's known as the island of a hundred towns, a hundred towns. So think about this when Paul says to Titus that I want you to ordain or appoint elders in every town. Uh, that would mean a hundred towns that the influence of the gospel needed to go in. But those churches, those groups of Christians had come back from Pentecost and they were struggling. These were churches that needed some leadership. They were struggling against the Cretans in the sense of the pagan culture of Crete. You'll notice that in the text, empty talkers and deceivers, evil beasts. There's a poet, I'm going to try to pronounce his name. You'll see an image of him on the screen, Epimenides. It's pretty close, I think. 
And he was known as a semi-mythical figure. He was tending sheep, and while he was in a Cretan cave that was sacred to Zeus, he fell asleep for 57 years. Now that is a nap. Think about that. He wakes up out of 57 years of being asleep, and he is then given the gift of prophecy. And he prophesies against his own people. And he calls them all Cretans or liars. He refers to the Cretans as the dregs of Greek culture. Dreg or dregs would be the most worthless of all. His own people. Well, it's into this setting and culture that Titus was to do church ministry. This is a difficult assignment. To be faithful and effective, Titus would need to be sure of his calling. We looked at that last Lord's Day. Serious about preaching the gospel and elevating the truth of the word of God, unashamed and bold. Sincere in the truth. Paul gives to Titus these words to help him and prepare him for the assignment that Titus will then have on the island of Crete and with the Cretans. Chapter 1, I want you to turn there, verse 5, and we're going to look down to verse 16 and see how Paul now addresses the need for church leadership. That's the big idea. I've titled this particular message, Qualified. Qualified. Now, what word do you see in the word qualified? Quality. Quality. Do you remember the Yugo? Remember that car, the Yugo? You'll see an image on the screen, right? I think it was made out of cardboard. I mean, you, you get what you pay for. And so the Yugo, many, many years ago, came with a complimentary package with duct tape and Bondo. I mean, that's what you got with it. Now, some of you are like, I'm going to send him an email because I had a Yugo, and he's offending me right now. It's not meant to do that. I'm just trying to prove a point. We're talking about quality. In fact, on vacation, I pulled into a parking spot up in Camden, Maine, and I look over, and there's a Yugo. I haven't seen a Yugo. I don't know if they ever, I didn't know if they existed. I thought they were all just dead and gone, you know, and there it was right next to me. Quality. In athletics, especially racing, you would have what are known as qualifying times. If you watch the Olympics, the qualifiers. We would say if someone able to get the job done, they are what? They're qualified. John MacArthur, and I'm going to quote him again, and this is the same quote that I used last Lord's Day. He said this, quote, The church depends upon its leadership. The strength, health, productivity, and fruitfulness of a church directly reflect the quality of its leadership. The quality, qualified. I want to look at three characteristics with you in our text. The selection, the standard, and the soundness. That's the three Let's look at number one, the selection, verse five, the selection. Notice the text, Titus chapter one, verse five. It says this, this is why I left you in Crete, Paul says, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. We'll go through the rest of those verses in a moment. This is why he starts off that particular section. There's a manifestation of the gospel. It's in verse 3 of chapter 1, the gospel meaning the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and sending of the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel. That message, that common faith that Paul said to Titus is what you're going to confront and clash with the Cretans with. Paul leaves Titus to take care of the work of establishing the churches to strengthen them. They had plateaued, some were in decline. They were in need of revitalization. To revitalize a congregation, you always start, listen, with the selection of the leadership. That's where you start. It has to start there. A struggling church needs right leaders. Does that make any sense? This is where Paul goes with this. Now, this is important for our church. Paul says to Titus, so that you, notice it in the text, so that you, who's you? Who's the you? It's Titus. So that you may appoint elders, that you 
might put what remained in order. So there was disorder in the church. There was disorder in the fellowships, the hundred fellowships, if you will, around Crete. And then Paul says to Titus, Titus, you're going to be the one that is going to select the elders. This is what he's saying. He was to appoint them. He had the responsibility for selection. So really, it's pastor to pastor, elder to elder. This is the selection process. Now, often churches will have congregations choose elders. Maybe they will have some kind of committee do that. Paul selected Titus. Titus selects those he believes are called, gifted, and fit for church leadership. Now, this doesn't mean there's not a testing. This doesn't mean there's not laying on of hands. And a laying on of hands is even the elders, if you look at the text. It's not the whole congregation laying hands on the elders or the pastors. It's the elders laying hands on elders to identify them, to confirm them. Now, who are the elders? The term elder can mean older person or elderly. We would refer to somebody that's older than us as maybe elderly. But it's much more than that. If you look at your Old Testament, you'll see that the origin of elders goes way back to Exodus, Deuteronomy. You see it in 1 Samuel. You'll see these appointed men that were leaders in their communities, leaders in the temple, leaders in the synagogues. It's natural for the elder to carry over from our Old Testament into the New Testament. It just made sense to the New Testament Christians. In Acts chapter 11, you see elders show up for the first time, verse 29 and 30. You can write all of this down if you want to look at it later. Acts 11, 29 to 30, also in 13, 1, 14, 23, 15, 2, 4, 6, 22, 23, and chapter 16, verse 4. If you need my notes afterwards, just let me know. <laughs> Don't try to write that fast. But I do want you to turn to 1 Peter with your, I didn't put this purposely on the slides. So take your Bible and go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Who are the elders? Now this is vital. Oh, I can't even begin to tell you how important this is. Because there is mass confusion in the Christian church about this topic. So 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 1. Oh, there's one more. Chapter 20 verse 17 if you want to write that down. So Peter's going to encourage, Peter himself is an elder. He references himself as an elder. Now, typically what I'll do is I'll go Greek on you, and we call that, it's Chobani time, right? Well, we're going to have a three-pack today, three-pack of Chobani. I want to give you just three words. You'll see them on the screen. First word is for elder or elders, presbyteros. It's where you get Presbyterian. So if you're from a Presbyterian background, that's really where that's coming from, that Greek word. It means elder or elders. Another Greek word is poimen. That's where you get the word shepherd or pastor. The third Greek word is episkopos, and that means bishop, or they give the oversight. My grandfather used to call me the bishop, and he wasn't off theologically and grammatically. My grandfather was not a Greek scholar, but somehow he knew that, that my title uh, is not just pastor, it's also bishop. So when he said, you're the bishop, he was accurate when it comes to 1 Peter chapter 1 and what Peter is saying about elders. Three Greek words all describing the same Person. So people have called me through the years, Pastor Chris. They haven't called me Elder. Uh, they haven't called me Bishop other than my grandfather. But you could actually call me all three of those, and you would not be off. Because they all describe the same guy, the same person. Just different functions of the calling. Sometimes I'm going to shepherd people. Other times I'm going to manage. Other times elders move into certain roles. But these descriptions here are interchangeable. What's happening in churches is that there's been a division. There's, there's church staff, or they would call that the pastoral staff, and then you have the elder board. So if you look at most websites, you'll see this separation. 
what ends up happening is that the elder board or elder team or elder committee then are pulling people in that they think are qualified, but many times they're not qualified. They're not called of God. They don't have a pastoral calling on their life. And so you have this board, which really was taking from the business world. You'll never find that in Scripture. Paul says to Titus, put what remained. Put what remained. Well, let's see what Peter has to say. For I exhort the elders among you as fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. He's a fellow elder. He knows what it is to be called to this. He's not just an apostle. He moved from an apostle status, moves into more of a pastoral elder status. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Then he uses the word poimen, verse 2, shepherd, pastor. Pastor the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. There's another word that we just looked at. Not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Of course, he then mentions in verse 4, the chief shepherd, who is Jesus, says, when he appears, you will receive an unfading crown of glory. That's for all those who are faithful elders or pastors. The word appoint is interesting in our text. It's used in Hebrews chapter 5 and chapter 18, and also in Matthew 24, 45. It means this, when Paul says to Titus, appoint elders. He means to set in an elevated position, set into an office. It means to install or, or to set over. And this is what pastors and elders, they're over the flock. They're called of God to be those people that would protect and lead and guide and feed the flock. Now, it's important to Titus, important for Titus to understand this, that Paul was then passing on to him from his apostolic authority, his pastoral authority. It moves over now to Titus. Titus, as an elder pastor, then is to select other men that he sees as qualified and then appoint them, set them over the churches in Crete. Notice it's elders plural, it's a team. Of, God, of called, godly, gifted leaders, caring for, feeding the flock, leading and protecting the church. The pastoral or elder team gives directional oversight of the congregation. Now, you remember last Lord's Day, I gave different polity. There's different uh, church government. There's, there's congregational church government. And there's a reason why congregational churches are dying, because it's not biblical that the congregation should lead then out of and over the elders or the pastors. There's also not an Episcopal, in my opinion, or a hierarchical type of leadership, where it is one bishop, and that one bishop then is ruling over everyone. I'm not for that either. I do believe it's a plurality of elders or pastors. It's a team. There's reasons for that. I'm not going to get into all the reasons for why it should be a team. That would be extensive. I'm just going to try to make it through point number one so we can get to point number two and three and won't be here for four or five hours. But uh, there's a, a lot of information that would be helpful when it comes to this. Maybe we'll do a follow-up series someday. But it needs to be a collaboration. That's what Paul wants Titus to understand. It's a collaboration of godly, wise leaders or Elders. Now, when I first went into ministry, I was pretty much top-heavy. I, I was underneath uh, a pastor who was from a very um, fundamental Baptist background. And so that fundamental Baptist background was very hierarchical. So it was one pastor to all the people. Have you ever been in a church like that? One pastor to all the people. And, and at first, I was like, well, I can see the importance of that, and I can still see some of the importance of that in the leadership context. But I just don't see it lining up with Scripture, and so it started to bother me. And I started to dig a little bit deeper into more of the Reformed or the Presbyterian model. And that's when I started to discover elder. And then even further than that, elders, or a plurality of elders. Jesus never sent his team out by themselves. He always did it two by two. Of course, he had 12 that he chose to be with him as apostles. So really, it's built into uh, the whole fabric of the ministry of, of Christ. 
I'm going to quote a man that uh, was used of God in my life personally. Uh, he came to our New Testament class when I was at Liberty University a long time ago. His name is Warren Wiersbe. Warren Wiersbe is in heaven now, but he wrote a book that uh, I read just recently. I did not know he had written this, The Strategy of Satan. And when Warren Wiersbe was 10 feet from me, I'm in the second row and he's preaching in our New Testament class, it just impacted me so greatly. This is a man of God. He understood leadership. He understood pastoral leadership. In fact, he was the pastor of Moody Church, which is a very well-known church in Chicago for many years. He said this, quote, Satan enters the organization of the church in the selection of leaders, including pastors. It amazes me how few local churches followed the instructions given in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus, end quote. It's shocking how many churches are then moving out of the word of God to then try to do church life. Paul knows this. He wants Titus to really grab a hold of it because if you're going to go into these towns in Crete against the Cretans, you're going to have to have more leaders. You're going to have to have more pastors and elders with you to be able to do this. And certainly, Titus, I don't want you doing this by yourself. It can't happen. So the selection is from the leader to the leader. It's from the pastor to the pastor, from the elder to the elder, from Paul to Titus, Titus to other elders. You find nothing in Scripture of the congregation voting on elders. They might affirm it. They might pray for, but there is no vote. Not in the text. The selection is given to the leaders to do that. Number two, you see the standard in verse six to nine. The standard. We live in a world where there's standards. Here's the definition, a level of quality, something measured and modeled. A standard is, is, is set up and established by an authority as a rule, and this is what Paul does. You'll see that in the text. He's establishing a standard because the Spirit of God has downloaded it to him and then he's giving it to Titus so that Titus can then give it to the other churches. There's a standard. He said put. Notice the word put what remains in order. Set elders in place and set the standard for what qualifies them. Every occupation has standards. Every position or title has standards. Whether you're a CEO, a president, and a governor, or a sports team manager, they're all standards that are involved in all of that. It matters if the people hold to standards. Well, the same for the church. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to look at verse 1 with you. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Again, a pastoral letter, and he's going to write this to Timothy, as Timothy is then serving and ministering and leading in Ephesus. We're talking about standards. The first standard for local pastors and elders, and when I say pastor and elder, I mean the same guy. Same guy. I don't, I don't make distinctions. That's important. I, I hope that that resonates with you because that, that's going to be a big deal going forward. The first standard is that elders need to be male. Male. Now, this alone is a debatable and, and, and hot topic. I understand that. I've been studying this for 30 years I've heard both sides. I've heard pastors that are friends with me or, and we're together, you know, doing life and ministry, and they disagree, and I disagree with them. And they say, no, it's egalitarianism. It's, it's, it's women can be pastors. They can be raised up and selected to be elders in churches. And I would go, oh, well, I don't know, but look at the text of Scripture, and I'm going to show you those. And so then they would come back with, well, that was cultural. That was, that was Paul. He was biased. It was the way that Paul would think at that time because that's the way they viewed women. They had this low view of women. And, and so if you go down that road too far, then what's going to happen is you're going to lose the inerrancy of Scripture. You're going to lose that the Word of God is perfect as it was written. And so I couldn't go there with my friends. And so I landed on the complementarian role or side of things is what they call it. So male. Now, I'm not going to go Chibani on you here because you don't need to. You don't need to parse Greek words here. Just read the text. Here we go. The saying is faithful and trustworthy, Paul says. If anyone, if anyone aspires to the office of overseer, what's the next word? He. 
he desires. So you're talking about church leadership, pastoral elders. This is the context. He desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The what? The husband. The husband. Able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. Verse 4. He must manage his own, his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. This is where the church needs to land. Now, this is what I mean by that statement. Just read the Bible for what it says. That's what we need to do. And so when I brought this to my friends, I said, well, this is talking he. These are, these are pro. And they would come up with all these different. The standard is male. Let me show you something else. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Now you can tie this all the way back to creation. And Paul's going to go from creation all the way to the church. We need to look at the standards here in the area of male first. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is what? Is the head of the wife. The husband is the spiritual head. He's the primary spiritual leader of the home. Even as Christ is head of the church, so there's the husband, and then there's Christ that is above the husband. His body and himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now watch how the church comes in, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle and any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. There's the balance. Wives are submission, aligning themselves under the husband as the leader of the home. And then the husband loves the wife as Christ loved the church. That's a high calling right there. <laughs> if you're a guy going like that, that's tough. That is a tough one. But God will help you to love your wife as Christ loved the church. In the same way, husbands should love their wives. Verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes as Christ loved, does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So, so what you're looking at is a comparison between the family and the church, between leadership structure in the home, husband being the head over the wife. And so in the church, then you have male leadership over female leadership. It's connected to creation. The Bible says that women are to learn in silence. That's in Corinthians. Now, some push back on that and said, again, that's cultural. That's the way it was in the culture. But that just is saying that women are not to ascend to the place of having an official authority over the man in a, in a positional pastoral elder sense. That's what Paul is talking about. He says that Eve was first deceived, then Adam. So the deception started with Eve, not Adam. We're held accountable in Adam. He's the federal head. In other words, if you, if you want to blame anyone, you blame who? Not Eve. You blame Adam. Because he's the federal head of the human race, so that in Adam all die, but in Christ all will be made alive. But, Paul says, the woman was deceived. So he goes way back to creation and what happened in the garden, then he goes all the way to the present moment and talk about the Christian church. This is how it's supposed to be. This is the standard. It's supposed to be male leadership as far as elder or pastor. Boy, do I feel alone. No, really, it just in all of, a lot of Christendom. Because it is, the, the church is fast moving to egalitarianism. Women are being ordained all the time. And my wife is, I, I elevate my wife like you don't even, I brag on my wife, don't I? You've heard me, right? I value her. She has gifts that are beyond me. But she knows that God has said in his word that the standard is that Pastors and elders should be men, men of God. Number two, or letter B, I'll put it, is moral. 
Here's the standard moral back in our text. Verse 2, Paul goes to, says to Timothy, they must be above reproach. This is, this is a, a standard that Timothy and Titus was to live up to. They are to select men to live in a way that is above reproach. This means that they're not perfect, but they are men who strive and pursue godliness. They can't be accused of something in a public way. In other words, you can't say of this man in a public accu accusatory way that this guy then has been living this life in a consistent, unrepentant way. If that is the pastor, and I've known pastors through the years that have lived lives that weren't moral, and they could be accused publicly by non-Christians, that man isn't holding to the standard that the Bible says. So he says here in the text, they need to be the husband of one wife, Faithful and committed to his wife internally and externally. His children or family need to be characterized by faithfulness. Ch children aren't to be charged with debauchery, it says, or insubordination. That really is in the context of adult children, not, not kids. I mean, how many pastors would be like, all right, you're disqualified. Because their five-year-old is like, like stealing cookies from the cookie jar. I mean, where would you draw the line with all of this? Well, really, it's talking about adult children who then are rebellious toward God. If that is the case, then the pastor or elder needs to be looked at very carefully and probably not brought on, Titus. Don't bring him on if then his children, who are adults, aren't living for the Lord, because that is the direct reflection in some way of their leadership. So you want to look at that, Paul says to Titus. It's important. They're not arrogant. I'm just going down through the list of some of these things here under standard. Not arrogant. I remember uh, in my 30s, I think every 30-year-old is probably arrogant to some degree. Would you agree? You remember being like that? That wasn't me. Okay. That was me. Arrogance. 30-year-olds. 30-year-olds. My 30-year-old decade was full of Chris, not Jesus. And so I was on staff with a pastor, and the pastor was, and I were having a conversation in the car one day, and, man, I'm going up against him, you know, and I, I think I know all that, and he's been in ministry 20-plus years more than me, and I'm, I'm going to confront him. I'm going to just say, hey, you know, you need to shape up or ship out, you know, and I thought I was all that. He goes, you're arrogant. I just kind of went back, and I was like, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? Such a great thing he said to me. I'll never forget that. So I try to encourage 30-year-olds, stay humble. Isn't that true, James? James and I meet every week for the last year. And I just try to tell him, please just be humble. God has gifted you. But your 30s will be that period of time where you'll struggle with that. Not that you don't struggle with it in your 50s. But it's another standard. Stay humble before the Lord. Not quick-tempered, he goes on. Not a drunkard. Watch that influence of alcohol on, on the person, on the pastor, on the elder. Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and then I'll finish with point number 3. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be what? Disqualified. Disqualified. Verse 9, this elder is to hold to the word of God. This man is able to rise up and rebuke wrong teaching. Those who come against the church, they're able to do this. And the standards are high for the pastor. The bar can't be lowered. It will dramatically affect the church. If, if you lower the bar so low that then any of these men can come in and be elders. The effects are great. The health of the church will be affected. Paul knows this. He needs Titus to be deeply, deeply committed to this. Number three, finally, the soundness, verse 10 down to verse 16. He starts with four. It's a transition. Titus is giving a, given a word from Paul on instructing people in sound doctrine. It's used five times in the book of Titus. The word sound, it means healthy. It means wholesome. The Cretans in the church, 
had rejected the truth. There were those who were in it for their own gain. The word is shameful gain, Paul uses in verse 11. And Titus was to teach in such a way that it brings rebuke. Now, remember I said in the book of Nehemiah that it's okay for people to get angry in a righteous way? But we handle it in Matthew 18. But there is a place that the pastor elder needs to rebuke people. There's nothing wrong with that. And it needs to be rebuked sharply. Because if you don't, then the whole church then will be affected by these people. This is what Paul's saying to Titus. You've got to put a stop to it. You've got to. This is your calling, Titus. This is every elder's calling. He says in the text, there are many that are in the churches. They had infiltrated. They had probably risen up from within the body. These false teachers, it was becoming widespread. It says here, and I'm still in the text, they are upsetting whole families. In other words, their influence then is spreading. It starts with themselves, then that spreads to another person, another family, and then it keeps moving out into the whole congregation. And you need to put a stop to that, Titus. Verse 12, which I've already read to you before, it says, Cretans are always liars. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, and I quoted that, probably that prophet that I quoted earlier in this message, the Cretans professed to know God, but they didn't really possess genuine salvation. I want you to look at the text. Go back to Titus if you're not there. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess, this is the Cretans, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. It's a tough, tough statement. Church leaders will have to confront error. They'll have to bring change. They'll have to challenge lifestyles that aren't consistent to the word of God. And this will require boldness and courage. Men who will have to lead against the current of culture that is anti-Christ. Pastors and elders who live with conviction. They'll have to endure criticism and attacks as Paul did, as Titus would as he moves out into his ministry assignment on the island of Crete. The people that Paul is describing in these closing verses in chapter 1 are going to make Titus's ministry very complicated, very difficult. They were known as Judaizers. These would be religious people, people that are rule followers. They stick to the law. That's Judaizers, and that's the people that Titus would primarily have to fight against and try to stop. They, they wanted to come against the churches. And now Paul says to Titus, you need elders, teams of elders, to be able to handle all of this. I want to go back to the liar piece here. The Cretans are always liars. What do you do with someone who's a liar? You rebuke them. You rebuke them, Paul says. The reason for all of this is to be sound. In verse 1 of chapter 1, he references this word, sound doctrine. In verse 2, he calls it sound in faith. And then verse 8, sound speech. It's going to take pastors and elders who are selected biblically, living out the standards given in the text, to bring about the church's soundness. A church will not be sound if it doesn't have the right leaders in place. It just won't happen. The church needs qualified men who are selected, they live by biblical standards, and they are sound in the faith. Any church desiring to be what God has called it to be must do what the Apostle Paul is saying here, must there is no negotiating here. And Titus had to have that. Pounded into him. Drilled deep into his soul. Because the church was at stake on the island of Crete. Just like it is today in our own day. Just like today.